Okay, so, as the silly graphic says, let's start at the beginning. One thing I like to do in, a, uh, in an early world history class like this, right, where I have to start all the way back in prehistory and work from there, you know, up through the Middle Ages. And that's a long period of time already, right? Um, it, we're going to be running through a lot of different cultures, right? Uh, a lot of different major traditions, a lot of different uh, religions. We're going to see tons of interesting things that humans have done, things that humans have come up with. You know, I'm going to swell your head with all this, ah, cool human stuff we've done here. So I'm going to start off this semester by making you feel really small, right? I'm going to start off with a bit of cosmology. Right, uh, a little bit of like, let's put humans into perspective, shall we? Right, instead of just focusing on the human story itself, let's take a step back and see where do humans sit in relation to the rest of nature and to the cosmos. So that'll be the first thing that I talk through here. Um, then we're going to talk about um, the basic concept of, of evolution as it relates to humanity. Right? And then I'll walk you through some of the, um, the earlier forms of man, earlier forms of humanity, right? including the last few of them that really are human in the sense of you know, you know, that they are recognizably human, but not us. In our second half today, we'll start in the prehistory of our species. Right? So, um, and <clears throat> if you remember our, our discussion here at the how the notes work, each one of these can have like a uh, a little description of what's going to go on in it, and here are those key terms to watch for. Now, there's one difference on the very first lecture in how I work the key terms from uh, all the other ones. And I broke it down this way because this term often ended up being very confusing for people. On the first study guide and first quiz you guys get, you're going to have a term, human evolutionary milestones. And that term is these four. Right? You know, steps along toward, toward us here. So rather, rather than counting on people picking out the, 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 the key moments in the discussion here, I'm kind of like, I, I broke that one down for you. Okay, so let's start with the beginning, right? So in order for there to be time, right, um, there needs to be a universe, right? And we need time to have history, right? right? Because history is change over time. Uh, Simply put, that's all real. All history really is, right? Is the study of change over time, which is why different historians focus on different subjects, different in different areas, and you know why why history can kind of like touch on so many different areas. You've got you know the history of philosophy and the history of languages and the history of warfare and that. there's histories of everything, right? Um, but history being change over time, we need to invent time first. To invent time, we need a universe. Right? We uh, exist in a particular universe, one observable universe, one in which our laws apply, right? uh, you know, the, the rules that we've sort of determined for the universe apply in this universe. We have no idea if they apply everywhere, right? but they apply to our universe. And we can only go back so far. We can only trace back uh, about 14 and a half billion years observable within our universe. That means we don't know if there's anything beyond this universe, we don't know if there are gods. We don't know if there is a god that created everything there. We don't know if there are multiple universes. We don't know if there was a universe before our universe and it ended and ours was created. We really don't know how that works. There's tons of different approaches to that, different theories to that. right? Um, and many of them will have to stay permanently in a realm of hypothesis because since we will not have the ability to look outside of our universe, we're sort of constrained by being within a particular system, right? Um, we're kind of like stuck only looking at that universe. Cool there? Here's just a fun illustration of like um, the many worlds hypothesis. These are all different universes, right? Um, that may or may not touch on each other. Some of those uni some universes might actually come out of like, you know, particular, you know, um, you know, like a black hole type event might, you know, connect into other universes. New universes might be formed as bubbles on an existing universe and might pop out as a big bang from that universe and create a whole new universe. We don't really know. There's a lot of, like, interesting work on that. But we have a beginning here to our universe that gets us started. And from that, there's rather a lot of time before humans show up on the store, you know, on the scene. We are real latecomers here, right? Human history, in all, of its, in all of its detail, in all of its wonder, in all of its beauty here, is nothing, right? You know, a, a grain of sand on the beach, right? So here's us showing up here, all the way at the end here, after nearly 15 billion years. Right? Um, 
So uh, let's take um, a step here and look first at our neighborhood, right? So they're like, um, look kind of beyond us. Um, how many planets are there in our, in, our, in our solar system? How many planets? What day of the week is it? <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's been a debate on that, hasn't there? Um, it used to be nine. I grew up with nine planets, right? Um, realistically, there never should have been nine, right? Um, because um, uh, Pluto um, um, and uh, its sister Charon are, um, uh, are, are realistically Kuiper Belt objects. They're too far beyond. They have a really weird eccentric orbit there. They don't follow the rules any that our planets do, right? We have eight main planets that have been there from the beginning, right? Um, there may have been one in between here. We've got that asteroid belt in between Mars and Jupiter, right? You know, tons of debris left over here. Um, but we've had eight for a very long time here. One of the fun reasons to kind of point to this here is that we often forget um, that while the Earth is extremely special, that it has is in that perfect little sweet spot. It's not too close to the sun where it's baking. It's not too far away where it's too cold, right? It's in just the right spot there, the little, little Goldilocks place right? um, where everything works out. That doesn't mean that this is the only place where life can exist, and it doesn't mean it's the only place where the basic elements of life exist. Right? Water, including liquid water, is quite plentiful in our own solar system. Right? Comets are full of water. Asteroids are full of water. There is water on the moon. Right? It's in the form of ice, you know, um, you know, in large chunks underneath the poles of it, but it does have water on it. We could drill down, extract that, and make water and oxygen out of it. Right? It does exist there already. Right? Um, a lot of the common elements you know, needed for life are present um, to varying degrees in other parts uh, of our own solar system here. Right? So there's rather a lot of real estate within our own that has you know, plenty of interesting things to look at. Here's our solar system. Um, there are also, in addition to the main planets, tons of moons. Right? Um, here's Luna, here's ours. Right? Um, and you can see there's quite a few other ones, including some that are larger. Right? Um, many of these are big enough to be you know, planets on their own if they happen to be orbiting the sun instead of another planet. Right? You know, some of these are quite large. Right? Um, and many of them have, again, all the, the uh, uh, tons of interesting elements, you know, things that would be of interest to us if we can get out there. Uh, Titan, for example, has lakes of liquid methane right, on, the, on the surface here, tons of hydrocarbons available there. Um, uh, Callisto, Ganymede, and Europa all have water. Right? In fact, Europa is a giant ocean covered in ice. Right? It's basically a ball of water. Right? And the tidal forces as it's moving around Jupiter continually need it and keep that water liquid, not ice. There is literally an ocean underneath the surface there. And it's possible there are smaller oceans beneath the surface of Ganymede and Callisto. They have larger cores, so there'd be less of it. But liquid water may exist in all three of them. Right? So it's a, a current area of study here. Uh, so uh, there's that. Um, <clears throat> and there's one of the reasons that Pluto uh, is not a planet anymore is that we have continued to find more and more objects farther out. Right? As the technology has improved, right, we've been able to see farther out in our own solar system and be able to see what's present out here. And some of these, um, things like Eris. Eris is bigger than Pluto. Right? So did this... But is this the tenth planet, or oh, that, and that starts that whole question? Okay, maybe Pluto shouldn't have been a planet in the first place. Maybe its weirdness kind of fits more into this category. Right? Um, so there are a lot of objects much, much farther out. Um, so there's that. All right, just for fun, here's some other ones. All right, now that is just our immediate real estate. Right? The things that we have already been able to see and are currently studying now. Let's take a step farther back. Right. Um, what makes a solar system a solar system? It has a sun. Right. You know, Sol, our sun, is a star. Right. Just one star. Right. Got its own internal hydrogen engine, kind of like burning in there, like you know, consuming fuel and passing out tons of heat here and affecting all these planets around there. And large enough to have the gra a, you know, a large enough gravity well that's pulling all these planets around. Right. There are a lot of those. This is our galaxy. Right? A galaxy is a collection of stars. Right? 
Um, the Milky Way galaxy is one galaxy. And in this galaxy, there are about 300 billion stars. Right. Um, I don't know if you can really wrap your head around 300 billion. That's, that's tough for me. Right? Um, one galaxy, 300 billion stars, nearly all of which are going to have something moving around them. Right? Uh, there are any planets around tons of these. Right? Uh, we have been looking regularly now in the last few years here and finding tons of extrasolar planets. Right? Um, every few years I update the numbers on here. Um, by August 2015, we'd already found more than 3,600. There's about 2,000 more since then. Right? We keep finding more and more of these as the technology improves. Most of these are either very close to their suns, so that you know, very, very difficult to kind of like, you know, imagine there where they're too large, right? We can't see as many like us, but in the last couple of years, we've started to find planets actually within that Goldilocks zone, right? Um, Earth-like planets, right? So maybe someday this will be a place where your descendants will live, right? Maybe somebody already lives there, who knows, right? But the fact that they're there is beyond dispute. We can no longer say the stars are just a light show to kind of you know, keep us up at night and just like, I don't know, just lay back smoking and whoa, man. There's actually something else out there, right? Uh, so here's our galaxy. Now let's take a step back you know, and put us into position. Here is where Sol is. This is us, this is our solar system, right? Um, this is within our galaxy, to give you a sense of the scale there, right? And this is about how far we've been able to look so far with our technology, right? So we can't see much of the solar system, and much of the, uh, sorry, much of the Milky Way yet, right? Much of it is simply too far um, for our technologies really to penetrate and actually be able to see into the different solar systems and see their planets and whatnot, right? Obviously, that continues to improve. Right? But we have so far been mapping a very tiny corner of one galaxy. Go there so far? You feel a little smaller yet? Just a little bit. Okay, so um, let's take a step farther back. Every single point of light in this photograph is a galaxy. Not a star, not a planet. Every one, from the largest to the faintest, that is a galaxy. Um, the, uh, these are um, exposure, these are long exposures, um, we call deep field photos. What we did with the Hubble telescope is we uh, positioned it to look at a very dark patch of the sky where, we, where there were no stars, so there'd be no light pollution in it, you know, aiming into the, the, just a, an area of blackness, and then have an extremely long exposure. Right to you know pick up little bits of light from a, you know from very far away, right? Uh, and this is what we see. What was it like thirty days or something? Yeah, yeah, they're, 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 you know, which is you know, which is insane for a picture, right? Yeah. Um, you know, imagine like the stabilizing technology to keep it perfectly still that long, yeah. right? Um, it's sort of funny, like you know, just thinking of the technology. I mean, remember what like a, a forty-six processor is? Way, way back. That, that's that's what drives the Hubble telescope. <laughs> There's not a lot. <laughs> There's not a lot. Not a very high-tech uh, uh, device there, but um, still a fascinating machine. Um, so we've got um, these the, these deep field photos here, right? Uh, looking out here, and we again have no true idea of how many galaxies there are because we we we, we can still only see so much. We can we can only kind of like estimate here, but it can be anywhere from like 200 billion to 500 billion, right? That is a lot of galaxies, right? And if each galaxy is going to have anywhere from like hundreds of millions to hundreds of billions of stars in it, that's a lot of real estate, isn't it? So um, you get uh, a sense yet of just how big our own universe is, right? Even without like uh, accounting for other universes and anything kind of beyond our universe, our own universe is already huge. And this is to me, um, there's, uh, one of the, the, the fun reasons going to point to this is there's a certain sense of wonder, I think, that can come out of this, right? Um, a certain sense of, of, of marvel at um, just how awesome nature is, how huge it is, how much there is still to learn about it. Um, they, uh, a number of years ago, they, you know what the Griffith Observatory is? 
right? Uh, it's up in, in, in LA, up on, on a hill over, overlooking Los Angeles. Um, it hasn't been a working observatory for a long time because there's too many lights here, so you can't see a damn thing most nights, right? Um, but in like 1930, it was a functioning observatory. Um, today, it's more of like a museum. People take their kids up there, and there's all kinds of little science exhibits, and they can show them how the old telescopes work and things like that. Um, years ago, they shut it down, and they dug out underneath to make a much bigger room to expand it, right? Because it's on, the, on, a, on a cliff, on, on a hill. There's not much, there wasn't any other land to build on, so they built down inside it. And there's a very long room in there. It's about as long as this building is, if you count all the classrooms here uh, in a row, right? As one long room, and about two stories high, right? You know, this very long, and all along one wall is a gigantic blow up, high resolution photo of that. And staring at that is honestly a religious experience for me because I'm just astonished at what is all out there, right? At just how big it really is, right? It really kind of helps me to sort of like center myself and put my kind of concerns into to place, you know? I might have been very frustrated about, ah, oh, you're down, you're this bill or other, you know, like, wow, gosh, that's just so much more than my, my little petty concern, you know? So um, I find that kind of interesting, really. Um, so, you know, does that, hopefully this is like accomplished a little bit of my objective and shrinking you a little bit, right? Making you feel slightly more insignificant because we're gonna spend the rest of our term here basically talking about all the cool things humans have done, right? Kind of like buildings back up here a little bit at a time, right? So my little introduction to that, um, just for fun, this one last one here. Look, at, look, look how crowded this picture is. Right? And a whole bunch of them are like circled here because they're just too small even to see. In, in the photo, right? Um, but if this were higher res, you could, right? There's a lot there. So, so there's that. <clears throat> okay, so, we're moving along, right? Um, uh, from here, rather a lot happens. The universe leading up to us, but we're not going to talk about the formation of the Earth and how the moon ran into it and all kinds of groovy things like that. We're not going to talk about the beginnings of microscopic life in the oceans and all this. It, it's not really relevant because it's a history class, darn it, not a science class, so why am I even talking about this in the first place? I had a specific purpose in mind there. And I'll have to talk about the science behind evolution a little because there's also a reason for that, but for the most part we won't get into that kind of topic. Right? So, um, here's my cute little uh, millions of years on one page. And there were dinosaurs, and then there weren't dinosaurs, and uh, we'll move along from there. So, um, let's talk about <clears throat> evolution as an idea. And this is kind of a fun one in, um, uh, in the United States because um, we are uh, relatively unusual among developed countries in having a very high degree of skepticism socially about evolution. Um, so I needed to address some of that, uh, otherwise uh, all my talk about early man could be like, well, irrelevant to you, because, well, it's just a theory, it doesn't matter to me, right? So let's talk a bit about what this actually is and why it really shouldn't be threatening, right? Um, because when people's um, uh, closely held um, belief systems come into conflict with, you know, certain empirical realities, it, it can cause a crisis in faith for people, right? And a faith that rejects the evidence for something actually weakens itself in the long run. It makes it harder to sustain, right? The stronger faith is the one that rolls with it, that adapts to it, that uh, is able to, to address these kind of concerns, right? Um, there's a lesson there. Um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you know anything about like the early modern world here and the Catholic Church's approach to understanding the, the discovery that we were not in the middle of the solar system, that we actually went around the sun, like, oh no, 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 because humans are super special and important and God made the whole universe for us, so of course we're in the very middle of it. This is a very difficult uh, issue for that. Today, the Vatican runs an observatory. The Vatican has people on its payroll who do what I was just talking about, study the stars. Right? They learned their lesson from that uh, episode. Right? And I think that um, uh, our, the, our stronger religious traditions are going to continue to do that right? and adapt to it. Um, it. In fact, most of the mainstream uh, forms of Protestantism, for example, have long since said that there are no problems with this. The Catholic Church says there's no problem with evolution. There's nothing inconsistent about under, you know, evolution and um, Catholic faith. Right? Um, it, 
it's uh, more a, a, a particular vocal minority here that kind of like pushes um, uh, the idea that there is a problem. So I want to talk about how this basically works. Because evolution is not itself an article of faith, and it's not a belief, right? Um, it is actually as much a fact as gravity is. So let's address that. Um, this comes up a lot. Um, evolution is only a theory, right? By which someone means to suggest that it's still open to question, that there's serious room for doubt, right? That it's, um, it's a guess, right? Well, you guys know that um, gravity is a theory, don't you? You know that gravity is still a theory? Gravity will always be a theory, right? Uh, because theory means a systematic explanation that fits all the evidence. That's it, right? A theory is a framework, right? The theory isn't the idea. The theory is the framework that explains all the material that you've got, right? Um, so theories are actually quite long and complicated, tons of maths and whatnot that go into that, you know, but a theory, for a theory to work, it has to be able to explain every bit of evidence that comes up, right? Um, and for several centuries now, um, gravity has fit every bit of the evidence, right? If that hat ever doesn't fall, we're in trouble, right? Uh, <laughs> so there are a whole lot of things into question, right? Um, but it is always going to fall, right? We understand how this works at this point. Right? Uh, gravity as a framework explains all of the evidence that we've accumulated even you know, now as we continue to look into the universe and whatnot here. Evolution is the same way. Right? Uh, for more than a century and a half, evolution by natural selection has been able to explain every single piece of evidence that's come up. All of them. Every little bit of it. Right? Uh, you know, from, uh, uh, from things found in the fossil records to uh, discovery of DNA in the middle of the 20th century here to um, you know, our basic morphology and our, you know, our, our physical form and our relationship to other species here. Um, you know, in terms of like, uh, experimentation in medicine, um, evolution is absolutely essential to medical innovation. Right? Nearly everything about modern medicine we know as a result of evolution being accurate evolution being true, right? If you throw that out, we've got nothing really. You, 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 we have to start over. I'll give you a fun um, way of, of picturing that. I can actually can build on the, uh, the, the medicine sort of example. Um, I'm going to assume by this point in your life that you've all gotten sick at some point, right? I know I get sick a lot because you guys come in and cough on me. You know, you know, dealing with lots of people, and you know, yeah, I, so I, I pick things up, you know. Um, people get sick, and sometimes you get sick, and you're, you're so sick that you have to go to a doctor. Right? And if you're so sick, you've got a virus or a bacterial infection or something, they might give you a prescription, right? You might have like an antiviral medication or an antibiotic medication, right? Um, you ever see on those bottles a label on the side that says, take all of this, these pills, take all of this medication, do not stop when you feel better? You guys are familiar with this label? You, you might have run into this at some point. Has anyone ever stopped beforehand? Good, yeah. No shame in that, because they don't really explain why, right? If they explain why, fewer of us will make that mistake, right? Um, because it's actually quite important, right? Uh, the reason for that is evolution, right? It's evolution in a nutshell. Here's how this works. Um, you have uh, some kind of nasty critter in your system. You've got a, a virus or a bacteria, something in your system that's, that's attacking you and doing something, it's reproducing and it's more and more of it, right? Um, you don't notice it immediately. You notice it and develop symptoms once there's a lot of it, right? Once it's reproduced to a certain point that it's affecting your system's functioning as a whole, right? Uh, and at that level, oh, the headache, oh, I'm running nose, uh, sore throat, and you got like all the symptoms, right? So you start taking the medication. Well, you start feeling better and the symptoms disappear, you haven't killed it all. You've taken it back to where it was at the beginning, a smaller population, right? But which ones are not dead? Which ones haven't been killed off by the medication yet? The ones that evolved? Um, they're all basically the same to begin with. They're the same basic species or strain, right? Um, but they're the ones that will, they'll evolve from there. But if you've got a whole bunch of something here, right? And I'm throwing a particular cure at it, right? It's going to kill off the, weak. the weaker ones. What was that? Yours? Yeah. Um, it kills off the weakest ones. So the ones that are left are the toughest ones. I can take it. I can, you know, take whatever you can throw at me, like the, the, the strongest ones. 
um, the very strongest of that particular uh, species of bacterium are the ones that are still around. And those are the ones that you guys cough up on me every year. Right? Uh, <laughs> so uh, these things constantly evolve. They constantly mutate. Right? Those stronger strains are the ones that are still around and they pass from person to person. It's one of the reasons that our medications have less and less effect year after year. Antibiotics are less effective. Part of that is also our misuse in you know, the um, meat industry and things like that. There's tons of other reasons, but that's one main key reason there is that um, the diseases themselves continually evolve, so they have to constantly felt, you know, come up with new approaches to new medications. Well, this medication doesn't work anymore, shoom, and come up with a whole new one. Right? Uh, see how, how this basically works here? Um, that is on a microscopic level how evolution by natural selection works. The stronger ones survive, they pass on their genes and reproduce, right? Um, and the weaker ones have died off. So, so we've got um, what a theory is, et cetera, et cetera here. Now, since I've talked a little bit more about uh, science again, um, I want to bring this around to history. Uh, and one of the reasons I think that this is uh, a useful beginning to a history class. Uh, now, History is not a science. It's sometimes classed in with the social sciences. They do that at this campus, for example. It is more appropriately considered a humanity, right? Um, you know, part of the, like, the study of humanity, of human societies here. So um, things like psychology, sociology, literature, um, philosophy, history are all humanities, right? They're all about the human story. Right? Um, and that isn't really science in the same way, um, but it has a lot in common with it. It's not science because history cannot produce truly objective information. Right? It cannot produce um, a truly objective picture of what the past was. Right? If you pick up a history book that was written 50 years ago, it's going to be crap. Right? It's a waste of your time to read old history unless you are a historian of history, <laughs> unless you're, you're studying the historiography, you want to see how people looked at things before. It's not that all the facts change, right? It's that interpretive models improve, new evidence shows up, new facts are discovered, new things are found, new records are discovered, people wrote something they didn't even know, a particular set of records existed somewhere else, somebody else found that problem later and corrected it. There's a, a constant criticism within it. Right? And that functions in the same way that the sciences do. Because the, the hard sciences also work through peer review. Um, when a scientist lays out a particular idea, they lay out a, a hypothesis or a theory, they've got their thing out there, they're not trying to prove something. No one sets out to prove evolution is, is true. That's not how science works. They set out to disprove it. Right? Experiments, everything else, all of it is an attempt to disprove something. Right? We're continually, we're still doing things. They're still launching things up into orbit here to run experiments testing um, Einstein's theory of general relativity. Right? It's still being subject, subjected to tests now. Right? Experiments are designed to disprove a theory when you can no longer shoot it down, it becomes accepted. Right? And it stays accepted until somebody discovers something that finally shuts it down. Right? Um, it's always open-ended. Right? There's a kind of suspensive, perm a permanent suspension of judgment in, in science there. It can't produce you know, something perfect there, but it does produce a much closer picture than, the, than, than history can get, because it does deal much more with objective reality. Right? Because there's so much subjectivity and in interpretation, because a human writing the human story is going to write it from his particular human perspective, and it will have his particular human biases, it can't be as perfect as the way the sciences work. You see how that comes in there? But it's subjected to the same kind of criticism. If I publish something, other scholars look at that, and they might say, well, that's good. Or they might say, that's crap. You forgot this whole archive. You forgot this document. You, you, mis you mistranslated this word, and that threw your whole interpretation off. They, they crit critique things. To get something published in an academic press in the first place, it goes through a review process before they'll even publish it. Right? They, they give it blind to other scholars to look at, and they get to say, okay, is this any good? They, they're giving it to other experts in your field. And, even if, and if they miss things, somebody else will later. And over time, other people will. Right? So if I'm reading old history books by this point, oh, I know, that's, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Right? Um, so you see how this kind of works here? It's a constant unfolding here. But it has a lot of the same basic biases. And one of those, too, is also... 
an empirical bias. Right? Um, you have to have evidence to advance something in history. Right? Um, to explain something, we have to actually have records for it. We have to have something to, to point to. It has to be able to, you have to be able to take particular sets of evidence and present a compelling explanation. The historical explanation serves the same basic function as a theory in history, right? It's a framework within which you interpret the data, right? We, you interpret the, the evidence that you've got there, right? And the better frameworks within history here, um, you know, are, are you know, comparable to, to good theories, right? Um, but they're only as good as the information that they have. Right? Um, if a, a new piece of evidence is found, it can often completely throw a, a story out the window. I'm going to give you a good example of that after the break. Uh, well, actually, no. Um, let's see. Were we talking about that? Uh, yeah, we will get to it today. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an, an example of that after the break here. Uh, and we'll, you'll see like a, a way that, like, a place where like the story completely shifted. Right? I'll, I'll tell you like how it used to be understood, and then here's what we have to you know, understand now because of what we found. Cool there? Um, uh, so, so you got like uh, some of the basic idea here, some of the relationship here, the, some of the similarities in thinking, even though it's not particularly a science here, and it is still, it does still have to be um, open-ended. It has to be contingent, you know, you know, uh, based upon what we know today, right? It appears to be now to be the case that this is what we have, how we can explain the past, but someone will come along later and improve that, right? And it always has to be falsifiable. There has to be evidence. You have to be able to critique it. I can't just say. Well, this, this happened because an angel told me, right? Or this, this happened because I had a great dream and the, the dream gave me the answer. That, that, that doesn't work. Uh, so, um, moving along here. So, this comes up, uh, comes, this finishes our, our, like, our, our little introductory part here where I try to make you feel a little bit small and talk about some of the sciences and the basic biases in the class and how it's structured here. I want to talk a bit about early man. Right, you know, you know our, early, our earliest, earliest evolutionary past. Right, yeah. Finish off the first part of today. Um, so let's start with what we are in the first place. You know, who we are. Um, we are human, right? The homo at the beginning of homo sapiens means man, homo, man, right? Um, so species of humanity. But humanity is essentially an ape. Right? The, 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 the differences between us and the other great apes are actually quite small. Right? Um, it's um, sort of an, an enduring bit of confusion for me that we continue to think about um, uh, critters like chimpanzees and gorillas as, as fit to be in a, 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 a cage smaller than this room um, on permanent display, but we don't do that to people. Right? Um, because they aren't quite intelligent. Right? Um, if you want to think, too, about the differences, you guys live down here in San Diego. You've got two massive zoos, you know, right? Um, each of which does have great apes in it, right? Um, so many of you, by this point in your life, will have seen apes before, right? Um, the difference between humanity, our species, um, um, uh, you know, Homo sapiens sapiens, right, and um, the, the, the chimpanzees and the bonobos, the dwarf chimpanzees, right, our two closest cousins, 1.6% of our DNA. That's it. That's what separates you from a chimpanzee, 1.6%. We are almost identical genetically. So that 1% does a lot of work, doesn't it? Because do I don't live like a chimpanzee, do you? Right? We don't look much like chimpanzees, and I'm a lot, I'm, I don't know, I'm kind of hairy, but... Um, most of you are considerably less hairy than a chimpanzee, you know, and you know, not as cursed as me. Um, but um, <clears throat> there's a, a lot that gets packed into that 1%, but it is still a 1% difference, right? Now, compare that to our next closest cousin there. What's the difference between a chimpanzee and a gorilla? 4%. We are much, much more closely related to chimpanzees than chimpanzees are to gorillas. Even though they both look hairy and walk bent over a little bit and live in zoos, right? Uh, but there's a much bigger difference between them. And you can see that in tons of like, their, their lifestyles. The studying of bonobos and chimpanzees can actually tell us a lot about humanity and vice versa because we have a tremendous amount in common in terms of basic social structure and psychology. That's not true with gorillas. Right? Um, gorillas have an extremely different lifespan. Uh, sorry, a lifestyle. Like you know, their, their, their whole like life cycle is different from ours. Like, everything about it. 
Um, so, um, there's a bit of that. Now, uh, thinking back about the whole question of evolution, right, this is another common thing that comes up here. Someone will say, well, I, I'm not descended from a monkey, right? Uh, and there's a, a kind of like knee-jerk reaction to that because you've seen monkeys in zoos and you want to think that that's your ancestor somehow. Well, the single best response to a, a, an objection like that is, yes, sir, you're exactly correct. You are not descended from a monkey because you're not. You and the monkey are cousins. Right? Um, you have a common ancestor. Right? Both of you are descended from something else entirely. You see how that works? Right? Um, other apes and monkeys are not our ancestors. Chimpanzees are not our ancestors because there are still chimpanzees. Right? They are still there. Right? They, 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 they're a branch off from the tree. So we can see how this works. You know, here's you know, us, right? uh, the genus Homo. Right? Um, and we are the, the last surviving of the human species. Right? Um, we've got two in uh, um, uh, just Pan. We've got our bonobos and chimpanzees here. And they have a common ancestor. If you go far enough back, you can see that they have a common ancestor. Right? But to get to the gorillas, you have to go back another step and find another common ancestor to there. To get us to orangutans, who are even more different from us, you have to go back another step. And they have a common ancestor. Right. Evolution doesn't work like a tree, right? And up there, it's like a giant web sort of branching out in various directions. It, there's no particular directionality or progress to it, right? Um, things just splinter off and head in different directions, right? So these are just different splintering branches heading off in different directions, you know, producing different things. And this happens over an extremely long, long period of time. Now, to give you an idea of how far back we're, we're looking here, so here's our humans and chimpanzees. Look how far back our closest ancestor is. Right? Um, six million years ago right, is how far back we have to go to find that common ancestor. Right? This is an extraordinary amount of time. Uh, so you talk to the, you know, you have the person here saying, well, I ain't no monkey. Right? Well, here's a monkey. Right? Macaques are not apes. Incidentally, I, I, I uh, it's such a pet peeve line. You still see it on television all the time, you know, people calling chimpanzees monkeys. Monkeys and apes are different things, right? It's like calling your dog a cat. It just doesn't make sense, right? Um, uh, here's an, an actual, like, you know, so we got a, a monkey over here. All right, but to get the monkey on there, look, 25 million years. There's a lot that separates you from monkeys, okay? Uh, that's going really far back. So, <clears throat> Let's figure out what makes us different. Because telling you 1.6% of your DNA, well, okay, there's a nice little technical difference. So there's a technical answer. 1.6% uh, of your DNA makes you different. But why? How? Right? Uh, how do we end up being as different as we are? How do we end up with these titanically big brains in the first place? Right? How do we end up with a much more complicated lifestyle uh, than the other apes have? Right? Uh, the key issue here really does come down to brains. Right? Um, the human brain is fantastically large. Right? Um, there are tons of positives that come in with that, like, I don't know, venting computers and whatnot here, um, but also tons of drawbacks as well. Right? Uh, uh, the key factor that drives that whole process is your hand. And I know that might seem um, an odd point. So let's think about this for a minute. Um, how do gorillas walk? On their knuckles? Yeah, yeah on, on their knuckles. They knuckle walk. They walk like this, right? They, knock the, they can stand up, right? And they can walk like this, but it's not comfortable, right? Their, their spine isn't really designed for that, right? So it's not comfortable for them, and they end up getting back down. It's most comfortable to walk like this. Now, if you're walking like this, if you're knuckle walking, can you carry much with you? You see the problem there? You can't do much with your hands. They are hands, you pick things up with them when you're sitting down, but they're a lot less useful than your hand is, right? So, um, you know, take a trip back here, about four million years, and we have um, uh, one of our ancestors born with a particular mutation that made him stand or her stand upright, right? Oh, man, this is so much more comfortable. Bob, what's wrong with you? You look, no, this is great, man. 
this, everyone should walk like this, you know? You're just, he's just standing upright, and it was the most comfortable thing, right? Um, because this is, you know, it was just a, a mutation in his you know, basic spinal structure. You with me here so far? Now, here's how this works. Once I'm upright, I've got a hand, right? And that means I can carry stuff, right? And if I can carry stuff, I can use stuff more. And now I have suddenly put a premium on intelligence. Because the more things I can come up with to do with my hands, the better off I am, right? Because I don't know if, uh, ooh, I just invented the stabby stick. Stabby stick, stabby stick, right? right? So the first guy to invent the stabby stick, well, he's got an advantage, doesn't he? Right? This guy is going to be a lot more successful <laughs> than the other guys, right? Like, hey, check this out. You see how this works? And you're like, oh, I don't get it. Right, well, didn't work for you, right? So, aha, I invented the stabby stick. I have this advantage now. You see how this works? Um, so, you passed on that little bit of cleverness, didn't you? Right? The little bit of cleverness that made you invent the stabby stick, right, now goes to my descendants who have a slightly larger brain, right? Um, and uh, that builds up generation after generation after generation. The, the more clever things you come up with, the more uses you find for those hands, the more things that you do, right? Um, the more our brains become our single greatest advantage. Right? And you think about other species out there. I mean, humans are clearly the most dangerous animal, right? Uh, uh, we're the only one able to live anywhere on the planet, right? Uh, and, you know, in any kind of environment. Right? Um, we can obviously kill any other species out there, but you know, I don't know, mano a mano, human versus tiger, who's gonna win? Tiger. The tiger wins, hands down, because the tiger has claws, right? And big teeth, and I've got um, fingernails. Right? Not very effective weapons. So I need the stabby stick. I need my gun, whatever, right? Um, to take that critter out, right? This is our weapon. Right? This is our advantage right? uh, relative to other species in the world. The larger the brain got, the more it took center stage and replaced everything else. Right? Uh, now that came with a lot of downsides as well. Um, let me give you just a, um, <clears throat> well, I'll give you two bits here. Let's, let's, uh, let's balance this out a bit here. Uh, I can pick on both the men and the women in the room a little bit. Right? Um, so the brain, first off, grows very slowly. Right? Um, the, uh, it requires uh, tons of nutrition. Right? Uh, it has you have a, a protracted childhood where you're basically like helpless completely. Right? You know, newborn babies can't support the weight of their own skulls, so they just flop around there and just lay there. They can't do anything yet. Um, you ever see um, animals give birth? You ever see like a horse give birth on a nature show or something? Baby horse squirts out and stands up. Right? So it's walking around. Right? Newborn kittens, they're blind and whatnot, but they can move and they crawl up to nurse. Right? They're able to move around on their own. Right? You put a, a human baby down and walk away, what's going to happen? Bye, kid. Bye. Going to do all right? No. It's going to die. Right? Human babies are helpless, and they stay helpless for a long time, don't they? If you walk away from a one-year-old, or a two-year-old, they gonna do very well on their own? No, right? Um, we uh, we even have uh, this protracted adolescence, right, where we're still learning things. Here's where I can pick on the guys for a minute here. Um, uh, how many guys in, in the room here under thirty? Right? Okay, yeah. So uh, most of them here under, under thirty. Here, I'm gonna go under twenty-five. Okay, still most of you, right? So um, your brain is gonna finish growing between twenty-five and thirty years old. Your brain is still growing, right? This is why um, most crimes are committed by men in their teens and 20s, and, by, and why men in their teens and 20s are often fantastically stupid, no offense, right? Um, because when you're 18 years old, you got your motorcycle, and you're like, I can totally jump that canyon, man. Vroom, vroom, you're ready to jump the canyon. And when you're like 30, you're like, oh, hell no. I, I, could, I, could, I could die doing that. Uh, you have a chance to think about the actions first, right? You're much less likely to, to get in an impulsive bar fight or something over a disagreement or something and like, ah, I'm gonna attack somebody, right? Uh, the impulse control is better as you get older. Why? Um, you guys have heard of gray matter, right? Your brain is, is gray matter, big chunks of like, you know, uh, you, you, the, the material there, but it also has tons of white matter, right? And the white matter is the connective tissue. 
that moves the signals around from different parts of the brains. Um, women's brains are smaller, but they're more densely interconnected, um, uh, and they communicate much more, much more quickly from place to place. Right? The brains function a little bit differently there. Men's brains are larger, but that doesn't make them smarter because it's spaced out more. The same amount of material is just spread out into a larger skull. Right? And that means it depends more on the white matter, on the connective tissue to do things, which means men's brains process signals more slowly than women's brains do. Yeah? And as that grows and, 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 and thickens uh, over your adolescence there, that will make you, you're, you that'll, that'll, that'll get you thinking a bit faster. It'll give you more impulse control. You see how that works there? Now think about this. If you, your brain is not finished growing until you're 30 years old, how long do you think our ancient ancestors lived? Probably about that, really. I mean, you know, no medicine, you're eating raw foods all the time, you have tons of, you know, bacteria and whatnot, you can't go to hospital when you get sick, right? Um, you know, I mean, your lifespan is not great. Right? Um, your chances of accident, oh, I just got eaten by a tiger, oops, right, are pretty high. So your brain is really growing for most of your life, right? The elders of the tribe are in their 30s, right? There's, those are your wise guys. Right? Um, it's not a, a coincidence that so many ancient civilizations consider 40 to be the age of true maturity and wisdom. If you've made it to 40 years old, by God, you've got it. Right? And of course, by 40, all that is, is fully, fully finished growing and you've had time to learn things. So that's the time when you're basically considered an elder. We, that, that's still pretty young in, in, in our society here because we live so much longer. Most people in the ancient world did not live as long. Right? Um, but that's a, fa a function of brain development. So. Let's, um, let's see what another kind of like, you know, uh, 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 uncomfortable one here. Um, so something for the ladies in the room. Um, you know, now, some people choose not to, not everyone will, right? But, uh, but many of you may choose to give birth at some point in your life, right? And if you do this, expect it to be uncomfortable, right? Um, because for human females to give birth is an extraordinarily complicated process here. Uh, in the contemporary world, most women survive childbirth. In the ancient world, that wasn't the case, right? Um, today, if you look around at your, your, at your families, right, and you look at the elders in your family, you know, the, 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 the great aunts and the, the grandparents and whatnot here, there tend to be more women than men, don't there? There are fewer older men, right? Um, and there's a number of factors involved in that, you know, the, you know, the higher risk life in, in, in part, um, as well as, for example, guys, your, your, um, your testicles are killing you, right? Testosterone is technically a poison. Right, so it, 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 it does eat into your life a little bit there. Right, there's, another, there's a whole bunch of small factors there that, that, that slightly sh shorten a male lifespan relative to a female one. But that's only today because of modern medicine. In the ancient world, men lived twice as long as women did. Right, women were dying in their teens, 20s, and 30s on a regular basis, right, because of how difficult childbirth is. Um, I give you an example of a horse giving birth earlier or a, kid, a cat giving birth earlier here. Doesn't affect them at all. There's, 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 there's no real pain involved there. The body's perfectly designed for it. Horse just squirts out, stands up. The, other, the, the, the female horse might have just continued eating the entire time and never noticed. Right? Um, the, the physiology is more complicated here. For a human female to give birth, the pelvis actually has to split open. The bones have to break open to do it. Right? Why? This. The skull is too freaking big. Our brains are too big. Right? That affects not only the babies who have to sit, you know, are, are helpless for so long and can't support the weight of it, but it also affects the human females, right? as well as walking upright. The, the basic spinal structure is also a complication there. Right? Um, now, if you think about this, if you think about an extremely high mortality rate among females giving birth, right, how is that worthwhile? Right? I mean, if, 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 you've got a, if you've got a flip a coin, fair chance of dying just to reproduce, this doesn't seem like a very successful species, does it? So you see how there's, there's a trade-off involved here? The brain gives you so many other advantages that it was worth it to nature to choose these adaptations consistently and let those brains get bigger and bigger and bigger. Because it gave so many other features here that it was actually worth the risk of people dying. Right? Because, at least from a, a purely biological standpoint, once you manage to reproduce, the, your purpose is, 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 is finished, right? Your, your genes are satisfied, they've, they've propagated themselves, they're done. You, you, you've given birth, you can die, right? That's kind of how, the, 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 on, a, on a purely biological level, they, they think that. We, of course, don't. You see how this works, though? Um, if you manage to reproduce, right, even once or twice, right, it was basically deemed worthwhile. 
right? So the brains kept getting bigger, right? And that's the start, right? So from the very first one, four million years ago, who can pick something up and move around and invent the stabby stick, moving from there and there, on and on and on, brains getting larger and larger. So um, I want to walk through a couple of basic highlights um, in some of the earlier steps here, right? Some of these um, you know, uh, ancestors to us. The first thing I'll point out is that um, so far as we can tell at this point here, all hominid species developed in Africa, right? And the ones that were descended from all came from Africa, right? Our ancestors are all African, right? Um, exactly where in Africa, we're not positive yet because new findings show up all the time, new discoveries kind of come, you know, you know, come here and you know, add certain complications here. But um, all of the most ancient finds are in, in East Africa, you know, all along yeah, 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 towards Southern Africa here. Um, so, humanity is born in Africa, and even much, much later, later strains developing from those early hominid lines, nearly all of them developed in Africa, right? Africa continued to be the birthplace of one species after another, right? There may be some that showed up in other places. There's a, there's a possibility of one called Denisovan that, that they found remains from in uh, um, Siberia, but they've got so few remains. They've got like a, like a, like a finger and a tooth or something like that, almost nothing. But it's enough like, to kind of get a, a, a sample of like, you know, <clears throat> the, the DNA from it and you know, recognize that this is a bit different. Right? If, that they find, if, they, if there are more finds that show up there, there may be one that developed there, but that would have developed out of a species that came from here. You see how this works still? And of course it died out anyway, so it doesn't really matter ultimately. All ancestors started here, so African origin at this point is indisputable. Right? Um, the next step is a whole range of what we call Australopithecines. Australopithecus is um, a, a different genus from us. They're, they're not actually in the Homo genus, but they're the direct ancestors of the Homo genus, right? of, of, of all the human species. Um, so we come ultimately from the Australopithecine lines. Um, and what these are basically, it, they're, they're, they're almost indistinguishable from, other, from, 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 from apes in the same time period, right? You know, they, they, uh, it, you know a lot of their descendants, you know, other descendants, you know, the branches off from them you know, farther back, right? Still look much more ape-like. The main thing that distinguishes the Australopithecines from other apes is the way they walk, right? It's simply that, that freak mutation of standing upright. That's all it really does, because there's not much else there. Um, you can see there's not much of a brain involved here. It's quite small. Right? Um, it's clever, but it's not going to be winning any Nobel Prizes. Right? But it's able to walk upright, and um, it develops uh, a kind of uh, limited um, vocal ability here, you know, because they are relatively clever in the same way that, like, for example, um, uh, so apes, for example, can learn sign language. They're smart enough for language, right? um, but they don't have the physiology for it. Right. As you're standing up, up, up you know, one, of, one of the adaptations moving up right here is this little development of, of vocal cords here. We also begin to develop tools at this point, right? Because hands are free, so you start finding cool things. You, you sharpen certain rocks to, to shave things and whatnot. Right? So cool there? So you see, here's a reconstruction of what one might look like. Right? Doesn't look a lot like you, does it? I don't know. Nah, I'm not even that hairy. Right? Um, so, Definitely looks a bit different, but walking upright gets us our start. Remember, we remember how that worked, right? That's a, so. To describe this, when you're talking about your human evolutionary milestones, when you when you point to the Australopithecines four million years ago, that's what you want to tell me about. Walking upright gives you the hands free, which starts that feedback loop to make larger and larger brains. Well, there. That's the big contribution for these guys. Now, there's a whole bunch of other ones here. Um, we're, not, again, not going to cover the vast majority of these because this is not an anthropology class, and I don't get to blab blather on uh, endlessly about all these different years. We're picking out just a few major steps toward it, right? So we've got a bunch of other Australopithecines here. Um, we're going to move forward here from our Australopithecus genus to our Homo genus, right? But our Australopithecines, four million years ago, the first of the Homos here show up a bit more than two million years ago. Um, I told you I have a terrible sense of humor. Right. Um, so, so you can see here some of the way the features change over time to erect us here. Right. Um, we're walking through right, um, three steps forward here. All three of these 
are close enough to us to be considered human. What makes them human? What is it, again, that, made us, that, that makes us human? What, what distinguishes us from other species? Brain and upright. The brain, yeah. Walking upright, too, right? But is, they're related. Right? So walking upright gives us that, the, the ability to develop the larger brains, and it's the brains that really make us human. These guys have large enough brains that they have developed fully functioning societies. Right? They have language, they have um, a social division of labor, do people have different functions, you know, you have, you have, you have different roles, right? Um, they, they, be, they develop like, you know, cultural elements and can pass on certain traditions, right? Um, they have the same basic access to higher functions that we do, right? Their brains are smaller, we would consider them relatively stupid, but we would still have to consider them human, right? They'd be our dumb cousin, right? Um, so that gets us up to um, our second milestone in our little list here is um, H. erectus. Right? This is the one I want to focus on of the early um, varieties of, of uh, the genus Homo because um, H. erectus does some, uh, some very interesting things. Right? Um, the key of which is the development of fire. <clears throat> so Homo erectus first shows up around two million years ago. Right? So from four to two, nice round numbers, easy to keep track of there. And in one million years ago, Homo erectus develops fire, learns to create it himself instead of just having it occur naturally, like through a lightning strike or something, actually able to produce fire on demand. Why is that important? What do we, what do we get out of fire? Uh, light. Light. Light is good. And heat. Let's, 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 we, get, we get to here. Right? So light and heat. So light lets us do what? See in the dark. We can see in the dark, yeah. So it's dark, it's scary out now. I can keep fire going. Maybe the predators won't get closer. Here comes the, the tiger. Get away, tiger! I've got light, right? Um, you know, I'm not scared as much. Maybe I can go into a cave too, right? Houses aren't possible until you develop fire because it's too dark inside most of the time. Why would you go inside a house, right? If you can have lights inside the house, it's just a dark cube, right? Um, so you, you can, not only can I walk into caves, I can start developing you know, the first kind of actual man-made habitations. Right? They somehow make sense now. Right? So uh, light, and then uh, what was the one you had? Heat. Heat. OK, so um, what does the heat give us? Cooked food. Cooked food is a good one. Yeah, OK. So um, how is cooking food helpful? What was that? Reduces the time yeah, it can soften it, right? Makes things easier to eat, which actually adds tons of foods that you wouldn't normally be able to eat. I mean, chewing on a root is uh, kind of time consuming, right? Um, but if I can cook that sucker, you know, uh, it's much easier to slip into my meal, right? So, softens food. If you get all potentially life threatening bacteria. Yeah, it kills off bacteria. Um, uh, here's a fun one for my social carnivores in the room here. Humans are not technically omnivores. We're certainly not carnivores, right? Um, we are somewhere in between an herbivore and an omnivore. We have a tiny number of the adaptations toward being an omnivore, but we are not a fully functioning omnivore because you, your digestive system is not designed for meat. The consumption of meat in larger quantities is actually life-threatening. In small quantities, no big deal, right? Little bits here and there, you're gonna be fine. It's, it's, it, I'm not saying like, oh, run away from it, never touch it again. I'm just saying though, when you're you know, nomming down a couple of McDonald's hamburgers every day, you can expect lifestyle diseases, right? Uh, in societies even today that do not eat the way we do in the West, osteoporosis doesn't exist, heart attack doesn't exist, stroke doesn't exist, type two diabetes does not exist, right? Atherosclerosis does not exist. There's tons of things that we develop specifically as a result of eating too much meat and dairy. Cool there? So our physiology isn't designed for it here, but the fire lets us do it, right? And you see how, why, that, why that's a difference there. An actual omnivore or carnivore coming upon a kill, maybe a lion left behind, you know, a half of a carcass, so there's like, you know, a, a bit of a, a gazelle just laying there, right? If you walk up and tear a hunk off a gazelle that's been laying there in the sun for six hours, you're probably gonna die. It just, that doesn't really work, right? The number of, the amount of bacteria is easily present in that, very likely to kill you. We do not have the, the, the stomach acidity that a carnivore does to kill off bacteria, right? Um, and we don't have the, uh, the very short, smooth colons to get things out immediately, right? The stuff sticks around in us for a long time. So if I can use the heat to kill that bacteria, I can, more, I can safely consume it in the moment, right? The longer term consequences were not 
a fear for our ancient ancestors here because they were dying in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. They didn't have to care about developing you know, uh, a stroke when they turned 60. So cool there? Killing the bacteria, very useful there. Yeah. Question, question video? Oh, I was going to ask, Ingrid was mostly just designed for like, small bits of fish as far as meat goes, because normally coastal, didn't really... Some of our earliest ancestors were um, uh, fishing, fishing people, um, particularly um, some, some that are found in South Africa, right? Um, uh, but we still don't have a lot of the physiological adaptations to consumption of meat in general. But fish is easier, right, because it has fewer of the things that are actually harmful. But we didn't go out and hunt and like, red meat. And... Yeah, people started doing it around this time. Right? Um, and we have been hunting for a million years. Right? But our physiology hasn't changed much in a million years is the overall point here. So we begin doing it here. We begin actually taking in red meat at this point here. But it's a relatively small part of the diet. Right? Um, and you know, relatively, you know, so it's uncommon. Right? It's also wild. So it's, it's lean game. Right? So you don't have much of the fats coming in here. Right? And as, as long as it was a small part of the diet, it didn't matter as much. And again, they didn't have the longer lifespans that we have where, where you guys might want to care more about what your health is like when you're 60. It wouldn't even occur to them. Right? But we did start consuming red meat as far back as here. But not enough time for the physiology to really catch up. Right? Um, so I can soften foods. I can kill bacteria. So cooking, really, really a big step forward here. This makes, that, that alone would make egg directus a major step forward for us. What else does fire give us? It allows us for like smelting of new tools and building materials as well. Yeah, in the long run it gives us a massive technological <coughs> step forward here, right? Um, we'll start talking about things like metallurgy after the break, but um, as far back as here, if you just take a spear that you might hunt with, right, and you fire harden the end of it, it's a much more potent weapon, right? Just adding a little fire to wood, right, makes for a, a, a more powerful weapon. You see how this works here? So it, it, it starts us along the road to greater and greater technological development, right? Um, so technology is a big step forward here. Um, well, there was one that came up when heat came up that I didn't think about. So, so the, the, the whole heat issue in the first place, it allows travel, migration, right? If you're Living in Eastern Africa, it's pretty warm most of the time because it's a tropical climate, right? It has um, hot and relatively dry and hot and relatively wet. Those are your seasons, right? Um, but without heat, would anyone live in Canada? No. No. It's cold, right? It, it just wouldn't be possible, right? With it, we're able to go anywhere. So it should not be a surprise to you that Homo erectus was the first of our ancestors to leave Africa. Right? And left Africa and was an extremely successful species too, in part because it spread out so far. Um, we have found Homo erectus remains as far from East Africa as northern China and Indonesia. You guys know about how far those are, right? That's a long walk. Right. Um, and Homo erectus was actually around for a long time too. The last Homo erectus actually died out only 200,000 years ago. Right. Um, so this is an extremely successful and long-lived social species. Right. So Homo erectus is a, a major step forward for us. Right. And we have fully functioning hunter-gatherer societies able to move around. Right. And begin populating the world. Cool there. So second of our little milestones there. Um, Here's a way of sort of visualizing that for a long period of time. You can see here's, here's H. erectus and where it branches off and how it continues for a very long period of time as it's spread around. When you spread a population out, evolution becomes difficult, right? Um, we're effectively not evolving as a species, even though on an individual level mutations will still show up here because our population is too spread out around the world here. So it would be impossible to really like get, get a particular mutation into all of us, right? Um, so um, the, that movement out of Africa is what helps uh, H. erectus to survive for so long. But the evolution continues. The process continues in East Africa to you know, produce new forms. You know, you know, speciation continues to happen there. So um, I want to get us toward um, the last major step before us, which would be the uh, Neanderthals. Along the way, I want to just quickly point to two others here. The main reason here is to just show you, look, look at these anthropological reconstructions. Look at these faces. If you saw this guy playing guitar on Venice Beach, would he really stand out to you? No. Looks pretty human, doesn't he? Right? I mean, he just looks like a, you know, just a dude, you know? Just, 
slightly darker dude, right? Nappy hair, right? Just, you know, playing this little guitar and rollerblading on the beach, right? I can totally see that, right? Um, Idobergensis and Rhodesiensis are both very close to us. Both of them first show up um, a bit over half a million years ago, so we're looking here, um, you know, 600 to 500,000 years ago. Right? One of them showing up here around you know, 300, 350,000 years ago. Right? So they're both relatively close to the time when Neanderthals are going to show up here. And they're big steps toward us. Right? Um, not really that distinguishable. <clears throat> um, Neanderthals are also quite close to us. Right? Um, in some ways, physiologically, morphologically, they are less close to us than, um, than the Rhodesiensis is. Right? Um, so uh, I'm going to point to a couple of those differences along the way here. But um, Neanderthals are, uh, are a particular uh, interesting step here for us because they are um, the second major one to leave Africa permanently right? and, and settle more broadly. Um, Neanderthals settled all over what is today Europe and the Middle East. Right? Got, as, got as far as, as Central Asia. Right? They, they, they scattered over a very large area uh, and stayed there for a long time. Um, what, what, where, did I, where, where did I take this from? But where's, give me this picture. Uh, it's from a like early 1990 movie uh, where it's like caveman in my backyard or something like that. Uh, there's, there's one, um, there's, um, so I think you're thinking of Encino Man, aren't you? Or, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, not what I'm really uh, going for here, but that, that's a good one too, that, that, that's cool. Uh, Encino Man would actually still be Homo sapiens. Uh, he would have been a human frozen in the Ice Age. Mm -hmm. um, have you uh, recognized this from? Yeah, it's the uh, the so easy a caveman can do. It. Perfect. Yeah. The Geico ads, right? Uh, before they went with the, the whole gecko thing, you know, um, and kind of like along the same time they were experimenting here, you know, good companies are always throwing out different advertising campaigns, and this one worked for a while. So there was a whole bunch of these different adverts, and and the the the, the joke here is uh, a company having an ad so easy a caveman can do it. This guy sees it, he's like, that's racist, man. I'm smart, you know. He's he's like really offended by it. you're calling me. Stupid. Stupid, man. Uh, and the reason I like that commercial is because it's true. These guys are every bit as intelligent as, as us. In fact, um, H. Neanderthalensis's brain, uh, uh, cranium size, is this brain, it, the, their, their brains are bigger than yours. His brain is literally larger than yours is. Right? Um, so in all practical terms, would have exactly the same cognitive abilities we would have. Right? So. Um, uh, by, by whether by choice or by design, the, the, the you know, by accident or uh, sorry by, by accident or by design, the, the Geico ad actually kind of like hits upon something that's actually true here for us. Um, this is the range that um, Neanderthals fall into. Right? So you can see they, they settle over a wide area here uh, across Europe and the Middle East and up into Central Asia here. Right? Um, the reason uh, I point to that is that as Homo sapiens leave Africa. Right, the main route out is along here, you know, like passing out along here. Um, some later pass along from here as well. Right? But as they're passing out into here, um, they're going to come into contact with Neanderthals. Now, we are different species, and most of the time, when a Homo sapiens and a Homo neanderthalensis um, would mate, you would not produce, um, you know, viable offspring. It would not actually successfully work. I mean, physically. You could have sex. That, that 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 all works, right? But it's not likely to lead to conception. But species that are relatively close, but are different, can sometimes produce offspring. Can we think of any examples there? Uh, the, the, a mule. A mule. Yeah. What is a mule? It's a donkey and a horse, right? Exactly. A horse and a donkey are two different, right? But a horse and a donkey can have sex and can produce a you know, living, viable offspring. The problem with mules is they're sterile, which is why mules are not an actual species, right? That, that, that interbreeding did not produce a separate species here. Um, it has to, a mule has to be produced, right? Um, but uh, we are closer to Neanderthals than uh, horses are to donkeys, right? So even if most of those interbreedings would have failed, occasionally offspring would have been born that were able to reproduce and they would have interbred with the other members of that species which means that all of the original population of Europe and the Middle East has a tiny amount of Neanderthal DNA. Like dogs, right? What's that? Like dogs? I, I wouldn't mean that. Well, uh, well, you said that? that some species can like crossbreed but if I'm trying to comprehend this correctly 
some a breed of dog can breed with another dog to make something here and then so on and so forth. Is that what happened? Ah, okay, so first, so in, in the intermingling there, you're still dealing with um, different breeds of the same species. So what you're talking about there, when two different dog species get together, that's more akin to what we yeah, in America call interracial marriages. Right? Um, yeah, that's closer to that because it's exactly the same species, you just look a little different. Right? Dogs are still dogs. But dogs and coyote can, can breed. Most of that time that would fail, but occasionally some would survive. And there actually is, we are watching this today, this is one of the places where well, we never get to see evolution happening. It's happening right now in the United States. Um, and there have been sightings all over the eastern seaboard in particular here um, of a new species that has elements of coyote and, and, and uh, escaped domestic dogs. Right? Um, uh, that is a little closer okay. because they are different species. And since they're relatively close in the first place, some of those offspring might themselves be able to reproduce. And if that offspring then reproduces with another coyote or a dog, it passes on some of that DNA. It's a relatively small part, right? Um, it, it'll, it'll be like um, from a fraction of a percent to 5%, right? You know, most people will not carry much of it, but there's a tiny amount of Neanderthal ancestry um, in uh, the populations uh, from this area here. Uh, so it means in some small way, Neanderthals are still around. Right, in some tiny little symbolic way where all of our other ancestors here have permanently died out here, some of this DNA does actually still exist in the human genome. Um, this, I think, is, is, is fun. Somebody kind of like, you know, building on the Rodin's sculpture, the thinker, right? Which, again, playing on the fact that these guys are, are quite intelligent, right? Um, so, um, as an intelligent species, we have evidence of Neanderthals building houses, right? Um, doing artwork, painting and whatnot. Right, you know, leaving behind you know complex tools. Neanderthals buried their dead, right? Uh, which is something very you know, significant for us. I'll talk a little bit about that after the break. Uh, we recognize this this here. The guy making this mask was having too much fun. This skull reminds me so much of and made it look like Chuck Norris. It's Chuck Norris. Yeah, Chuck Norris is a Neanderthal. Somebody always recognizes it. I love that. I mean, I cannot. I can't look at that and not see Chuck Norris. But you can still see the thicker brow ridges and whatnot here. It's clearly, you know, from a Neanderthal skull. Who's the guy on the bottom right? Ozzy. Ozzy, Ozzy yeah. Ozzy was one of the, the one of the early um, volunteers for these genetic tests once they managed to sequence the, the Neanderthal genome, um, and he volunteered to it, maybe sequence himself to see how much. So he's like, I don't know, like four or five percent Neanderthal, something like that. Um, so <clears throat> put him on there. <clears throat> Um, here is one key difference you can see. Here are two skulls. Which one is yours? The one on the right. How, how can you tell? What's different? A sh shorter, shorter face. More like bigger brow. It's the yeah, the thicker brow ridges. The face is a little bit shorter here, but the, but, but you, you, you got a much taller like your forehead, right? Um, this goes up here, where this goes back more steeply. Right? Um, the Neanderthal skulls protruded out the back of it. Right? They're much heavier in the back. Instead of going up, they sloped over. And that worked because Neanderthals were a bit stockier. They were a little shorter, very broad, muscular. Right? So the, the, they, were, they were stocky to support the weight. Go there. Um, physiologically, there are a number of differences uh, between uh, us and them. One of the things that will actually lead them to die out in the long run here um, uh, is Changing climates. Um, Neanderthals don't sweat. Um, human beings can sweat. And you might think that sweating is kind of icky and gross and whatnot here, but it's actually a super useful way of uh, the body regulating its temperature. Um, if any of you have ever like, yelled at your dog for digging in the backyard on a hot day, just don't. Like, leave a spot for it because they're doing it because they're, they're, they're hot and many dog species are actually burrowing animals. They, they try to get to cooler earth to cool themselves off. It's also why dogs pant. Dogs can't sweat, right? The only way for a dog to regulate its body temperature is to roll in something cooler or to drink liquids, right, and, and breathe. <laughs> Neanderthals had huge noses, right, and they regulated temperature through a larger nose, right? So um, they were more susceptible to changes in the climate than we are, right? Uh, so cool there? So they do eventually die out. We probably played some small role in that. Um, Humans and Neanderthals did inter interbreed, but we also probably fought, right? Um, and clearly, one is going to win out, 
right? And as you're competing here over, you know, uh, over territory here, you know, wars probably played some small part in that. Starting um, uh, about 50,000 years ago, definitively, um, our species, Homo sapiens, leaves Africa. Our species itself is 200,000 years old, possibly up to 300,000. Right, it depends on whether or not some more recent finds are kind of like, you know, definitively chosen to be part of our species here. We're not sure yet, but we are at least 200,000 years old. For most of that time, we stayed in Africa, right, you can see in East Africa here. Um, and there's some evidence of moving back and forth as far back as 100,000 years ago. Some people may have been moving here, but also then back to here, right, so living in this basic area. But starting about 50,000 years ago, we moved permanently out of Africa and began settling all over the world. Right? Um, and gradually reached every possible bit of inhabited land uh, in, in the world here to sort of settle it. So cool there. Uh, we're going to talk about you know a little bit about that. The the part after the break is like super short, right? Um, because again, early day. Um, you know, so here's where we're going to like wind down a bit. And since you guys are stuck in the desk, I'm sure by now everyone wants to get up. Here's our slow devolution. Uh, um, all right, so. Um, Let's take a break.